Hey, welcome back to the channel, Top G's. Today we're looking at North Melbourne champion coach, Dennis Pagan. So today we're looking at his open mic special like we do with most AFL people. And let me just say up front, this isn't a hater video, okay? Dennis Pagan, in my mind, is a legend. And one of the reasons that I had a great childhood because I followed North Melbourne and those were the golden years. And this man is partly responsible for that. However, on this channel, we do look at the positives and the negatives Mostly the negatives because it's more interesting. There are better stories and people want to hear things from the past that they haven't heard for a while. And the positive things are already good. Everyone already knows that. So anyway, that's why this channel is the best. Let's have a look at Dennis Pagan's open mic. Look, probably the biggest lesson I've probably learned in life, and I reckon it's probably the biggest weakness in the Australian culture at the moment, is about accepting responsibility for your own actions. No regrets, no excuses, no alibis, never point the finger, never blame anybody else. And, you know, I've lived by that, and that's probably the biggest lesson I've learned in life, not only in football, and that come from Ron Barassi. I love this about Dennis Pagan, and he instilled this into those North Melbourne players in the 90s. But he is so right about this generation especially. Nobody wants to be accountable for their actions. They want to blame somebody else. But let me tell you, there is great empowerment by taking responsibility for things. And even if it's not your fault, you can just go, well, whatever. I'll take it as my fault. I'll move on from it, and I'll learn from it. It stops you from whining. It stops you from complaining. And you start to control everything in your life, and that's what you want. Okay, now he's going to talk about some of the grand finals. Probably... Um... <coughs> You probably missed a final, missed a premiership in um, 98. You agree with that? Yeah. No should have won that. Yeah. But should you have won 99? I mean, does it level out? Oh, I think it does. We, yeah. we weren't the best side in 99. No, Essendon, Essendon were, Essendon were yeah. by a country mile. Yeah. I can still remember uh, the Bombers. I think that Dennis Pagan is selling North Melbourne a little bit short here. Uh, 98 North Melbourne were definitely better than the Crows, and we beat them twice. But they matched up really well against us, and unfortunately we kicked 6-15 at half time. Uh, to their 4-3, so what was that? would have been 51-27. to 27. So instead of 6-15, had we kicked 9-12, it would have been 66-27. to 27. No doubt that would have been the end of the game. Uh, and it's unfortunate in the end they overran us, but we were definitely the better side than the Crows. But in 99, Essendon were only one more win ahead of us. So 18 wins, we had 17 wins. They beat us twice during the year, so if it was a sunny day, on grand final day, they probably would have beaten us by a good five goals. But having said that, North Melbourne won the last seven games of that season. Uh, well, the last eight or nine, if you count the finals. And Essendon won seven in a row before losing to Carlton. So both teams pretty evenly matched, despite Essendon beating us that year. Before the preliminary final was played, people were queuing up, going right down Napier Street, around the corner <laughs> into Fletcher Street. And I thought to myself, gee, this is amazing. So whether that had any... Yeah, the Essendon fans were definitely pretty cocky and they didn't think Carlton was going to get over the line by a point, that's for sure. Impact on the play. So they were queuing up for grand final tickets, yeah, and they hadn't earned their, their way into it yet. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And that, that's only the supporters, yeah. but that yeah. was, you know, I just wonder whether that had any effect on the the players. I, look, I thought in '94 we were beaten by uh, Geelong with the last kick of the day. I reckon if we had got into the grand final against West Coast, I reckon we could have uh, done a pretty good job mm. there too. Mm. But wasn't wasn't uh, meant to be. I don't agree with that, and I think Geelong deserved to be there because Geelong beat us twice during the year. Uh, like I keep saying, and they beat us in the preliminary final. They beat us three times, so they deserved to be there, even though we were slightly higher on the ladder. And West Coast beat us twice as well, and they had no problems playing at the MCG. So North Melbourne were probably the third best side that year. You know, 98, I think we kicked well, a lot of points. Might have you been did, 15 yeah. points to half time. Yeah. Yep. Um, and, and we came in and all the I hate this game. I can't even watch this game. And I could sense uh, this one. The 98 grand final is just one game. It's just, it's just annoying and frustrating to watch. And, uh, looking good for the Kangaroos, and it, and it came to fruition in the second half. How deeply did '98 cut, Dennis? It did. We were the best. Uh, we were the best. Oh, it's fucked. Can't even watch it. All right, let's talk about Wayne Carey. <laughs> Dennis, do you accept any responsibility for the events that ended the relationship between Wayne Carey and North Melbourne? I mean, he, he, to, on the outside looking in, it looked like he was the victim of a culture that he could do what he liked at the footy club. Yeah, look. People take your greatest strength and hit you over the head with it. Um, did I have anything to do with the the, uh, the situation that exploded? I suppose. Um, look, it's something you don't even want to talk about. I don't think. I don't think I, I did. Um, you didn't have anything to do with it, but how it got handled could have been a lot better. And unfortunately, you didn't shun Wayne Carey and say this is the biggest betrayal that anyone could ever do to a mate, to a teammate to the footy club, and they should have... I mean, he left, yes, but they really should have put him on his ass and not put him in the Hall of Fame and had nothing to do with him. And Pagan's really nicely nice about how he talks about this. You know, it was one of those things that happened in life, 
it was terrible. Um, you it's know, not, I'm, I'm sure. It's not one of those things. It's a guy who's a total narcissist and a total prick, uh, thinking he can do what he likes and banging the <laughs> the wife of Anthony Stevens. And a lot of people keep saying to me, oh, he's Kelly Stevens, you know, takes two to tango and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, Wayne Carey's in the public eye. He's the guy that everyone looks up to. He's the guy that has the responsibility, not her. Okay, so he's the one that has to know better. If people could change events, they certainly mm. would have. But mm. they were they were out of uh, uh, the control of uh, individuals, and only one or two people could uh, could have. That was a very nice way of saying that. Change it. And you're extremely close to both those people. We're talking about Wayne Carey and Anthony Stevens, weren't you? Left you in an invidious position, didn't it? Well, it did. And, you know, I couldn't take sides with it. You know, mm. I support... Anthony was at the club. He was the new captain. Um, we supported him, you know. Uh, Wayne went into virtually in, into, uh, into hiding, and I spoke to him about it. And, look, there were there was things that um, occurred that shouldn't. It's amazing. Every time there's a, uh, an indiscretion, they always bring that up. must be terrible for uh, Anthony to see that. Um, yeah. yeah, it is. And, look, <laughs> this is a hard kind of thing to say but Anthony Stevens was he handled it fairly well except he was cucked a little bit when they played them in 2003 North Melbourne played the Crows and Carey really rubbed it in kicked the first goal made them look like shit I think Stevens bumped him and bounced off him and Carey got the last laugh the Crows won the game there really was no consequences for that and him and Archer and all of North Melbourne should have said fuck this guy we're going to take him out. We're going to hit him every time he goes near the ball so he doesn't want to play anymore. So he wants to get off the ground and he'll never fuck with North Melbourne again. Unfortunately, North Melbourne didn't project that and they got totally walked on and Dean Laidley is responsible for that, in my opinion. I just hope that Anthony get onto, onto his life and he's, you know, he's, he has. he's proven what a... Anthony Stevens is a tough guy, no doubt about it. A great ambassador and, and a wonderful... Uh, player he was to lead um, the Kangaroos and you know the, the way he did that it was was just terrific after those sorts of issues. Mm. It was almost a mortal blow for the footy club I mean you left 12 months later did that have any impact on your decision to, to leave North Melbourne? No uh, my contract was up I would have preferred to stay at North Melbourne. Would my, you? Yeah no doubt about that. My the only thing is with North Melbourne we made seven preliminary finals in a row from 93 to 2000 two premierships and a lost grand final uh, we've never had that success since. And, you know, there's been a couple of finals, preliminary finals here and there with Brad Scott or whatever. Uh, but no, since Kerry left, that place has fallen apart. No premiership since 1999, going on 25 years now. So that was definitely the golden era and we haven't been able to replicate it since. All right, let's talk about Carlton. The move to Carlton, it turned out to be a disaster, didn't it? <laughs> That's the biggest understatement of all time. Mm. Yeah, it certainly did. From day one, um, you know, I can remember. Um, I can remember my wife saying to me next morning. She said, are "You sure you've made the right decision here?" <laughs> Based uh, on what? Oh, just, just you know, it was sort of the way it ended at North Melbourne. That wasn't given any publicity in, in those days. It was more or less Pagan's gone for money, and I didn't. You know, as I said, oh, I didn't get up in the media and discount it or anything at that. Stage. Well, who cares if he did leave for money? He was at North Melbourne for ten years had a track record of success, it makes sense that he would go somewhere else for more money. They just, just moved on with it and, you know, from the moment I went to Carlton, you know, from, you know, losing your picks, um, a very a very public sort of, um, um, you know, clash between league heavyweights, Graham Samuel and John Elliott and then mm. get those uh, uh, fines and uh, sanctions and that sort of stuff. And, you know, from, the, from day one, I think Carlton were the oldest list, uh, the highest paid. That's interesting, though. It's easy to blame the fines, the draft picks, John Elliott... Uh, you know, old Carlton players still hanging around. But Kudafidis even said that Dennis Pagan's game plan was outdated. You know, the kick long, the Pagan's paddock, all that sort of stuff had been figured out more or less and the times were changing and defence was changing. Um, and that was one reason why Carlton got left behind. But if you take a look here, you can see that Carlton in 2003... They got four wins in his first season, but then they got 10 wins in 2004. So they could have been a competitive team. And then they went four wins, three wins and four wins. So four out of the five seasons, he got four, four and a half wins or less, essentially. And Carlton lost every single game in 2007 after Pagan left as well. But you can't just blame it on draft picks and all the stuff that happened. Because if you look at Carlton, especially in 2003, in his first season, some of those efforts were deplorable to say the least. And they finished the season losing by 122 points. 
And if you watch that game against North Melbourne, Carlton sucked badly. And they didn't provide contests. They didn't have any skills. They would miss short passes, easy things like that. So you can't just blame the politics of Carlton. They just weren't a good side. Okay, They just weren't a good team, even though they had some decent players there. Okay, let's have a chat about his son, Ryan Pagan. Years 2000, your son Ryan is on the list. You give him three games, I think the first three games of the year. Mm -hmm. Mark Dawson, your long-time lieutenant of chairman selectors, leaves apparently because you demanded games for Ryan. Is that story true? He left. But the thing about it, and look, it's, it is a sensitive question. Um, he didn't answer that straight away. He didn't say, no, I never demanded that. Um... Ryan was getting uh, 40 positions in the reserves at that stage. Mm -hmm. He deserved a chance. But look, um, in retrospect, I would have loved Ryan to go somewhere else. Mm. And that was the start of my, the start of uh, my demise there at, at the Kangaroos. Um, you know, people thought that I had too much control. And, you know, you, you mentioned Mark, and, and he was probably one of the ones who... Uh, um, you thought that? Uh, yeah, thought mm. that. Did you, did you gift Ryan those games? No, I certainly did not. So certainly the vote not. at the match committee was... For him to be in the team, yeah, I discussed it with uh, with my loyal t lieutenants and that sort of stuff. If anyone was against it, why didn't they speak up mm. at match committee? Was I that much of a tyrant? I wouldn't let anyone to talk. Mm. Yeah, we Just on this as well, here's my thoughts. Hang on, let me get yeah, this. We uh... My my thoughts on Ryan Pagan were he was probably a little bit too slow in my opinion for the AFL, especially in 2000. Um, and you know he was quick, he was fit, he was enthusiastic. Just was up against big bodied blokes and North Melbourne in 2000, their whole philosophy was about strength in the midfield, which is why they faded out a lot in the last quarter in that season uh, because they were big, they were tough, they were strong, they weren't as fit as some of the other clubs cardio wise. And so they were big bodied players, and Ryan Pagan wasn't one of those players. He was probably slightly bigger than Brett Chandler um, and so didn't really have that physicalness that North Melbourne needed in that midfield. Now, my experience with coaches and family members or sons or whatever is that they tend to be more harder on their children and they, they f actually give them shit in front of other players. And I always found, look, when I was playing under this coach, his son was playing in the same team as me when I was playing under 17s. Uh, this is, I know it's not, you know, amateur league or AFL level, but even in junior footy, um, this coach, any time this kid did something wrong, he would be all over him and he would be a lot harder on his own son than he would be on the other players in the team, which I think is fair enough. And fuck, my dad was hard on me any time that I was doing anything, so I understood it. So a lot of us growing up in the 90s had those fathers that weren't lenient towards us who were just kind of like, oh, yeah, give my son a game. My dad was the same when I was playing footy. He was like, you've got to fucking earn it. You know, If you're not training hard enough, you're not doing the things they want you to do, they're not going to give you a game. That's that. But in terms of Ryan Pagan, probably a decent VFL player, just not, at, not up to AFL standard, and he probably played his three matches... And that's that. But I don't think it needed to break the club up. Okay, that's my thoughts on Dennis Pagan. And look, I know this interview is from 2012. It's 12 years old. Like I said, we cover a lot of previous events and things that happened over the years. Because I get people in the comments saying, oh, why are you talking about this stuff? It's like 20 years ago. Because it's interesting. And people like it. So let me know what your thoughts are in the comments.